part of the committee meeting. The sixth item of business on our agenda today is to hear evidence on the draft Pollution Prevention and Control Scotland Amendment Regulations 2017. May I welcome the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform and Andrew Taylor, the Air Quality Policy Manager for the Scottish Governments. Yeah, government, I refer members to the papers and can I invite any questions from members? Do you wish to ask? Yeah, yeah Claudia Beamish. Uh, uh, apologies, convener. Yeah, uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. And uh, I would just like to highlight uh, the position that I understand is the case uh, for Scottish ministers, that they are able to actually uh, make, the, um, make the SSI more robust if it relates to air quality issues and any problems in relation to air quality. I understand from our, our notes and just wonder if that's something that might be considered. And also that for the... Um, for those um, uh, emitters that are between one and five um, uh, megawatts, it would seem to me that um, 2029 is quite a long um, lead-in time, and I appreciate that emitters will have to change technology and or adapt technology, but I, I wonder if there was any comment on, on that as well. Um. Not really. I mean, from our perspective, these are very technical um, uh, SIs. They're, uh, um, they're transposing a um, European directive. Um, and uh, in fact, they don't apply to huge numbers of, of uh, uh, um, generators in Scotland. Um, we estimate about 2,000 um, by 2030. I think the, the uh, dates for compliance will be UK-wide. These, um, these are not our dates, if you see what I mean. We're actually, um, uh, and the 2029 date is indeed for plants between one and five megawatts, but these are UK-wide dates. So we are fitting into a framework which is a UK-wide framework. Um, we are we're bringing these amendments, this SI forward just now, but there will be changes next year because we're watching what's happening with the English uh, equivalents, which having been brought in, are already being changed. And there didn't seem to be much point us going now if we were simply going to have to change again. So we are fitting into a UK fri wide framework uh, on this. Okay. Could, could I just highlight um, through the convener, I, I should have perhaps referred to where I was, um, where I'd found the information about the possibility for Scottish ministers to um, make it more robust, and that is actually in the Scottish Government explanatory note, which is Annex A in our our, um, our briefings, and it says under Regulation 17. Um, if I may, convener, just read out that sentence. The amendments require that when preparing an air quality plan, Scottish ministers must consider whether to include measures imposing lower emission limit values uh, for MCPs than those set out in the medium combustion uh, plant directive, if that would make an improvement to air quality. And we did have evidence uh, last week in our committee about background um, air quality uh, and concerns about that. So I was simply really highlighting that um, to you, Cabinet Secretary. Sorry not to have given the detail when I first asked yeah, the question. I, yeah, I, I, I think that, um, uh, I mean, as I indicated, we, we're kind of regarding these as fairly technical um, changes to, to just capture um, uh, generators that aren't actually currently captured uh, by, by anything to make sure that we're not getting left behind. Um, uh, but, uh, um, uh, I mean, this will... Uh, um, this will make environmental benefits, it will help the UK meet more stringent targets, but it's not, from our perspective, is not a, is not a kind of huge uh, change. And there are some aspects of it which currently we don't have generators of the equivalent in Scotland. Um, and one of the things that we have to just watch out for is that we don't open up a loophole for them to come in, which is why we're looking at 2018 
again um, for more changes. But it's not a, it, I mean, from our perspective, we were looking at this purely as a, as a fairly technical exercise to make this transposition. But, but I think Claudia Weemus has highlighted a wider issue, and perhaps you could write back to the committee on, on those wider points when um, it's appropriate to do so. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 um, I mean, I don't know whether Andrew wants to add anything, but from, from, from our perspective, as I indicated, we are, we are seeing this as a technical transposition <coughs> rather than, than, than uh, uh, looking at um, that very much wider uh, um, aspect. I mean, there are some issues contained within it, which, yes, I have questioned, which is the issue about the diesel generators and the concern that there might be that we would see an increase in those um, which we wouldn't want to see for obvious reasons. Um, but these are not a big issue in Scotland at the moment. So, the, the, you know, from the perspective of where we are just now, um, it's, it's uh, from our perspective, although it's part of the broad spectrum of air pollution uh, uh, regulations, it's not a major one. Okay. Mr Taylor, the mic will come on automatically. Yes. I mean, the regulations do allow potentially for tighter emissions limits to be applied. Under these regulations, all medium combustion plants will be, have to have an operating permit from SEPA. And it may be, well be the case that SEPA may well decide in circum certain circumstances that a permit does um, justify tighter air quality standards. And that will be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah, I simply wanted to highlight the, the issue because of um, the very serious concerns of this committee about air pollution, and, and I've done that. So, um. George Stevenson. Uh, it's probably a question for Andrew Taylor rather than the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, just on the one to five megawatts, is it not the case that a large proportion of uh, such facilities will actually be standby generators for hospitals, computer centres and so on and so forth, which are used pretty infrequently and therefore have a very long life? And so therefore it would be disproportionately economically um, bad news to replace them uh, early in their life cycle and perhaps that would help justify perhaps some of the dates associated with these smaller generators that are used very little. Um, yes, I mean, um, compliance costs are going to fall disproportionately on, on smaller operators, which is one reason for the, for the longer leading time. And there's also, there, there are a number of flexibilities in the, in the directive, which we have to the most um, part employed in the regulations. And one of those is that um, plants operating for less than 500 hours per year on a five year rolling average are exempt from the requirements because applying li emissions limit values in those cases would, would not be proportionate um, given the limited emissions reductions that would um, be achieved and the associated costs for small operators. Um, I've got an indication here that uh, for small businesses operating plants at the lower end of uh, the requirements between one and five, um, they would end up with annual compliance and administrative costs between zero and two percent of gross operating surpluses, and that's for small businesses. Um, uh, so there are costs involved in this. Um, and, uh, and that, trying to help balance out that cost will be one of the reasons why the long lead time for, for total compliance. But as I indicated, we are trying to keep within our UK-wide framework on this. Um, and uh, uh, we're going at a slightly different time for technical reasons, but the idea is that next year we will be, it will all be in line across the UK. Okay. So perhaps in due course, as I said, when it's appropriate, you could update the committee on the more general aspects of it. Uh, any other members? John Scott? Well, um, thank you, convener. My question was essentially around that. The impact assessment estimates annual costs of 3.8 million. Um, and what is the industry view of those costs and the additional cost burdens? And I was going to ask particularly about uh, small businesses. I think perhaps you've just really answered I've that answered, question. yeah. Th there, th there is a, a total annual cost um, in 2030 is that the £3.8 million is the 2030 cost. So um, that would include compliance, administration and monitoring. But of course, there are offset benefits 
um, although the benefits won't necessarily accrue to the individual businesses. Um, but that is where the broader issue comes in, because the offset benefits are environmental and health and uh, relate to um, reduced emissions. Uh, so, uh, but, but that's kind of one of the reasons why I suspect there's been fairly long lead time for this. Okay. okay. Do any other members have questions? Everyone's content. Okay, we move then to uh, agenda item seven, uh, which is consideration of the motion, which is SM S5M08384, that the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee recommends that the Pollution Prevention and Control Scotland Amendment Regulations 2017 draft be approved. Cabinet Secretary, do you wish to add anything to that? Uh, no. Okay. Do you wish to do it, then move the motion? I will move the motion. Thank you. Any members wish to speak to, the, to that? No. Uh, so I've put the question on the motion. The question is that motion S5M08384 and the name of Rosanna Cunningham be approved. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Uh, I ask the committee to delegate the signing off for the subordinate legislation report to myself. Is that agreed? Thank you. I uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary uh, and her official for their attendance, and we'll have a brief suspension to allow the changes in officials. To the Good to go. Okay, thank you. The committee uh, agenda item eight is the Wild Animals and Travelling Circuses Scotland Bill Stage Two. I again welcome the Cabinet Secretary for the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform and her officials, Andrew Vos, the veterinary head of animal welfare, uh, the bill team leader for the Scottish Government, Beverly Williams, bill team manager from the animal welfare team. Angela Lawson, Solicitor of the Scottish Government Legal Directorate, and David McLeish, Parliamentary Counsel for the Scottish Government. Members should note that officials are not allowed to speak on the record in these proceedings. As this is the first stage two of the current session for this committee, I wonder if members would welcome my um, laying out the process for them on the record, with apologies to those who've been through this before. Everyone should have with them a copy of the bill as introduced, the Marshall list of amendments which sets out the amendments in the order which they will be disposed of and the groupings. There will be one debate for each of the four groups of amendments. I will call the member who lodged the first amendment in the group to speak to you and move that amendment and to speak to all other amendments in the group. I will then call any other members who have lodged amendments in the group to speak to their amendments as well as any others in the group, but not at the t that time to move their amendments. Members who have not lodged amendments in the group but who wish to speak should indicate me to myself or the clerks that they wish to do so. If the Cabinet Secretary has not already spoken on the group, I will invite her to contribute to the debate just before we move to the winding up speech. There might be times when I allow a little more flexibility for members to come back on points of clarity that have arisen from the debate. The debate in each group will be concluded by myself inviting the member who moved the first amendment in the group to wind up. Following the debate on the group, I will check whether the members who moved the first the member who moved the first amendment in the group wishes to press it to a vote or to withdraw. If the member wishes to press it, I'll put the question on the amendment. If the member wishes to withdraw it, I will check whether any other member objects. If a member objects, the amendment is not withdrawn and the committee will immediately move to vote on it. 
If any member does not wish to move their amendment when it is called, they should say clearly not moved, and uh, any other member present may move such an amendment. However, if no one moves the amendment, I will immediately call the next amendment on the marshalled list. Only committee members are allowed to vote. Voting on any division is by a show of hands, and it is important that members keep their hands clearly raised until the clerks have recorded the vote. The committee is required also to indicate formally that it has considered and agreed to each section of the bill, so I will put a question on each section at the appropriate point. I hope that is clear to everyone. So we now move to the um, procedure, and I call Amendment 4 in the name of David Stewart in a group of its own. Yeah, Sorry, interest. Absolutely not. Uh, in regards to wild animals in travel and circuses, Bill Item 8. Can I refer members to my register of interests? I am the cross-party uh, convener of the Showman's Guild Scotland and an honorary member of the Showman's Guild Scotland. Thank you, Mr. Lattles. You're missing me not to give you that opportunity. Do you have any other members have interest to declare? Um, John Scott. I should declare an interest as an honorary member of the BVA. Mark Ruskell. And I should also declare an interest as an honorary member of the BVA as well, convener. OK. Everyone else satisfied? Thank you. So, um, I call Amendment 4 in the name of David Stewart and a group of its own. David Stewart to move and speak to Amendment 4. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, as members know, the Bill's long title is an act of the Scottish Parliament to make it an offence to use wild animals in travelling circuses, and the explanatory notes refer uh, to, and I quote, the offence of using a wild animal in a travelling circus. Uh, one kind, however, notes that Section 1.1, as originally drafted, does not refer to using a wild animal in a travelling circus, but rather to causing or permitting an animal to be used. It might be argued that using actually includes causing or permitting use, but it would be helpful to make that much clearer on the face of the bill. Otherwise, it's conceivable that a sole operator who trains and performs with his animals could argue he was not causing or permitting use as no other person was involved. Uh, Amendment 4, in my view, adds useful clarity to the bill and is consistent with the drafting of other instruments, such as the UK Government's Wild Animals and Circuses Bill, published by DEFRA in 2013, and the new Irish regulations prohibiting, pre prohibiting the use of wild animals and circuses, which comes into force uh, on the 1st of January 2018, which states, a person shall not use or cause or permit another person to use a wild animal in a circus. I believe this is a reasonable and uncontroversial amendment, and therefore I move uh, amendment for convener. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Do any other members wish to comment? Mr. Scott. I would just um, support what Mr. Stewart has said. I think it's a, a reasonable amendment and um, one that we should certainly consider. Okay. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Um, can I thank David Stewart for uh, lodging his amendment, um, the effect of which would be to make it clearer that a circus operator who uses a wild animal in a travelling circus is guilty of the offence. Um, the provision in section one of the bill, uh, as introduced, would have included this situation since circus operators directly using a wild animal are effectively causing its use. However, uh, we do think this amendment removes any doubt and therefore we're prepared to support it. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. David Stewart to wind up and press or withdraw uh, his amendment. I, I appreciate support from members and the Cabinet Secretary, and I press the amendment for. Okay, thank you. The question is that amendment four be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. We now move uh, to call amendment five in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, group with amendments six and seven. Cabinet Secretary to move amendment five and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, convener. I just <coughs> get into the start of a slightly longer speaking note for this one. <laughs> um, I move Amendment 5 and uh, indeed will speak to Amendment 6 and 7. Um, if I could just take a minute to outline the thinking behind these amendments. Um, the committee raised concerns in the Stage 1 report regarding Section 1 of the Bill as it relates to the effectiveness of the ban on the use of wild animals in travelling circuses in Scotland. In particular, they noted that the use of the word purpose in section 1, subsection 2, could be interpreted to mean that if a wild animal was transported with no intended use in mind, but was subsequently used in a travelling circus, no offence would have been committed. Um, I thank the committee for their close scrutiny at section 1, the, uh, of section 1. The intended effect of section 1 
is a ban on the use of wild animals in a travelling circus. The purpose, intention or manner of transport of the travelling circus in transporting a wild animal shouldn't be the focus of the offence. And we certainly want to avoid any loophole, for example, where a circus could claim their wild animal is a pet and so was not transported specifically for the purpose of use. We also don't wish to inadvertently capture within the offence movement of wild animals which does not mirror the movement of the travelling circus. For example, movement for veterinary treatment. Um, my officials have considered the drafting further and I've lodged these amendments to address the issues raised. Um, these amendments to section one remove the reliance of the offence on the intention or purpose of the transportation, removing the requirement to establish intent. Adjust the wording to refer to an animal that is transported to a place where it is used, thus establishing a factual situation that may be verified more easily. Adjust the wording to tie the offence to a particular rather than generic travelling circus by providing that the offence may be committed in relation to a travelling circus and making further changes so that references to a travelling circus become the travelling circus. Um, mirror the new drafting proposed on the definition of travelling circus in the Scottish Government Amendment 8, which comes later and which we're presuming um, uh, will be agreeable, um, so that the offence is only committed if the wild animal is transported, whether regularly or irregularly, from one place to another. Um, I think these changes fully address the concerns of the committee regarding the effect of the offence. Stuart Stevenson. <coughs> um, I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary could confirm that in changing uh, the wording from a travelling circus to the travelling circus, from generalities to specificity, um, that has not introduced the danger that uh, someone transporting uh, in one context but for the use in another context, we're, we're not mismatch, disconnecting the transport from the, the circus in a way that uh, defeats the objectives that we have? Um, that is not our view. These, you know, these amendments have been drafted to try and ensure that, uh, uh, in a sense, that we didn't capture the wrong things or indeed exclude other things. So I think that the, the, the new drafting uh, of that tightens that up um, and ensures that parallel transportation you know, doesn't get caught in a situation where we're actually talking about a travelling circus. But remember, this is about offences. This is actually about um, committing offences. So the, the, that clarity, we think, makes that a lot more straightforward um, when that's being looked at in terms of any offence. Do any other members wish to contribute? <clears throat> no. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, to uh, wind up. Um, I, I don't think there's really anything extra I need to add um, uh, other than just to reiterate that this is to tighten the whole thing up so that the nature of the offence becomes even more clear. Therefore, the question is that Amendment 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah, we are agreed. I call Amendment 6 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment uh, 5. Cabinet Secretary to move. Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. We are agreed. I call Amendment 7 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 5. Cabinet Secretary to move. Moved. The question is that Amendment 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question now is that Section 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I now call Amendment 1 in the name of John Scott, grouped with Amendments 14, 15, 16, 2, 17, 18, 3, 20 and 12. John Scott, to move Amendment 1 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener, for the opportunity to, to speak to and move my Amendments 1, 2 and 3 and to speak to the other amendments in the group. Amendment 1 and 2 seek to create a list of wild animals not to be used in travelling circuses. Amendment 1 details where lists of such wild animals might be found and seeks to place such information on the face of the bill. Amendment 2 would allow ministers by regulation to specify a species or a kind of animal which is to be regarded as included or excluded from such a list and the process of doing this would be by negative instrument. 
Amendment 3 is consequential to Amendments 1 and 2, and all of these amendments respond to the view expressed in the committee report and during the Stage 1 debate that a list of wild animals as might perform in travelling circuses should be placed on the face of the Bill. Of course, these amendments will usefully enhance the Bill in terms of clarity, but they can also be regarded as probing Amendments 2. And I welcome the fact that the Cabinet Secretary has brought forward Amendment 12 in response to my amendments and Mark Ruskell's amendments 14, 15, 16, 17 and 18. And I note Mark Ruskell's intentions to also create a list of domestic animals which, if you like, seeks to achieve the same objective as my list but approaching the end point from a, a different direction. I also believe Mr uh, Ruskell's list even at a cursory glance, has some omissions, uh, most notably reindeer, much discussed by this committee and indeed much in service at this time of year. Um, and so, conveners, perhaps uh, Mr Ruskell's list highlights the point made by the, the bill as drafted of the difficulty of providing exhaustive lists. Uh, turning now to Cabinet Secretary's Amendment Number 12, I, I welcome the Government's um, further consideration of the need for greater clarity, and I look forward to Cabinet Secretary's explanation of what additional clarity this amendment will provide. I also note the use of may in subsection 1 and 3, and wonder if may should be left out and will be substituted to take matters forward. Convener, I look forward to comments of others. Thank you, Mr Scott. Mark Roscoe to speak to Amendment 14 and other amendments in the group. Yes, um, thank you, Convener. Um, we have a, a definition of domestication uh, within the Bill. I think, though, at the end of Stage 1, uh, we came to the conclusion that there were problems with this, that it was interpretable in different ways, um, particularly when you have animals, that, wild animals, that have come from captive breeding stock and have been tamed uh, over a number of generations. Uh, so it does create a, a loophole within the bill at the moment, a loophole which could see certain wild birds, reptiles uh, and small uh, mammals being used uh, in circuses, even though they are actually wild species. Um, so the question this grouping is about how do we close that loophole? Uh, I appreciate uh, John Scott's amendment. Um, I think I initially uh, was on the same page as you in terms of defining wild animals and creating a negative list. Uh, however, there are problems with that, and I think the list that uh, John Scott has, uh, or the definition that John Scott has provided, uh, does result in uh, significant emissions, including, I gather, raccoon dogs, which are increasingly used in performances and, and circuses. Um, I would say in terms of the Cabinet Secretary's amendment, um, it's welcome on one level, but effectively it doesn't deal with this issue right now on the face of the bill. It says, let's put in a regulation-making regulation power and we can use it at, at the government's discretion uh, when a particular problem arises. I, I think we've got time uh, within the passage of this bill right now to actually get a much clearer definition uh, and whether that's a list that does or doesn't include uh, reindeer or raccoon dogs or whatever, uh, let, let's bottom that out at this point rather than leave it uh, to the courts to decide or for a future regulation to have to be brought in at a later date as a result of a, of a legal action. Um, essentially, I'm bringing forward uh, two options for the committee, um, both of which provide the clarity of a list of domestic animals. So it's a positive list of domestic animals that could be used uh, in circuses, so a much shorter uh, list. And this would be brought in before uh, the bill was actually uh, enforced and, and enacted. The first option uh, is to provide that list. Um, you see that in the amendment, and also a way of updating that list over time. So that's amendments 14 and 20. Uh, this is a list that's been uh, drawn up on the basis of, uh, of the culture of how uh, animals are used in circuses in this country. Um, and based on other countries' lists as well. Um, it acknowledges that um, there are animals which have been used, which have a long history uh, of use and of breeding, and that are fundamentally altered uh, from the wild uh, type. Uh, the second option is to uh, create a, a power so that uh, a list could be brought forward. But again, I, I go a little further than the Cabinet Secretary here in suggesting that this needs to happen before the bill is actually 
implemented and we need that clarity. So whether it's a list that's on the face of the bill and approved at this point, or whether it's a list that has to be generated before the bill is enforced, I think that clarity is important. Okay, uh, Cabinet Secretary, speak to Amendment 12 and the other amendments in the group. Um, if I could uh, come to uh, Amendment 12 um, after I've spoken to the other amendments, I think it might make more logical sense. Uh, I mean, obviously, um, this is about the committee's concerns regarding uh, clarity in the definition of a wild animal. Um, uh, and I understand the recommendations of the committee about including uh, a list, um, I understand the motivation behind why people would think that's a good thing, um, but this kind of definition in legislation uh, often becomes incredibly problematic, which is why, in general terms, it doesn't happen. Um, so if I could thank the committee for uh, their consideration of the issue um, and deal with uh, the amendments. First, the group brought forward by John Scott um, the idea of referring to existing lists of wild animals um, under the Habitats Directive and the Dangerous Wild Animals Act 76, um, the idea that that could potentially help define the kinds of wild animals that are and are not, con well, the kinds of animals that are and are not considered wild in terms of the Act, um, he's taking a similar approach to mine in proposing to additionally provide a power for Scottish ministers to specify. Um, whether a species or kind of wild animal is a uh, kind of animal is wild or not. However, as drafted, um, I, I rather fear that the approach taken by these three amendments would render the bill ineffective without secondary legislation, uh, without extensive secondary legislation. The approach in its current form would automatically exclude any wild animals not considered a dangerous wild animal or of particular conservation importance in Europe. And in particular, it would exclude foxes and raccoons, which are currently used uh, in one particular circus. It would also exclude other animals that might be conceivably used, uh, including woolly lemurs, tamarins, guanaco and vicuna, night monkeys and squirrel monkeys, all the different kinds of monkeys that, that are and can become uh, popular uh, in these sorts of uh, circuses. Second, secondary legislation listing a wide range of animals would therefore indeed be required immediately the Act came into effect, but it would be difficult to provide and keep up to date. Um, it would have to be exhaustive, and it's very difficult to see how it could be an exhaustive list, um, and would have to include not just wild animals, but hybrids, um, that a travelling circus could possibly use and would create constant problems because you would have to be constantly uh, monitoring that. If I could turn to Mark Ruskell's amendments, they're the kind of other side of this particular coin um, uh, because Ma Mark Ruskell is trying to um, list the domesticated animals that can be used as opposed to the wild animals uh, that can't be used. Um, and uh, 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 listing... Uh, domestic animals may seem simpler than listing wild animals, um, but it would still require debate and updates to legislation should the status of certain animals within the British Islands change, not least since the offence would be triggered with the use of any animal not listed. Many of the animals listed in Amendment 20 are quite clearly commonly domesticated animals, and there's little need to list them, as these types of animals will already be exempt from the ban under section 2.2 of the bill. However, some of the animals included within the list in Amendment 20 are not commonly domesticated and are what we would consider to be wild. For example, palace cats, sand cats, and the Scottish wild cat. Furthermore, many commonly domesticated animals are missing from the list in Amendment 20, including llamas and alpacas, and they would be an example of changing uh, 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 culture around animals because I guess 20, 30 years ago you wouldn't have regarded llamas and alpacas as commonly domesticated in the UK but I think most of us recognise now um, that they are um, and, uh, uh, and um, also missing might be various small animals commonly kept as pets so if the list isn't absolutely accurate some travelling circus operators could conceivably be prosecuted for using a kind of animal that is indeed commonly domesticated 
in the British Islands, while others might legally use what are in reality wild animals. And in a sense, this just comes back to the issue about lists. Um, I, I do stand by my previous advice that a list of the kind of animals that should be considered uh, by species, by subspecies and hybrids wouldn't be practical. It would be difficult to ensure that it was exhaustive. Anything not on the list would remain legal to use, providing a way for travelling circuses to keep using wild animals by constantly adjusting the kind of animal they use. There would be a requirement for frequent updates with each update doubtless causing significant debate among stakeholders. Now, I add to this advice my observation that listing domestic animals that are not to be covered by the ban simply gives rise to the same problems. It would be difficult to ensure that the list was exhaustive. Any wild animals inadvertently captured by the list would remain legal to use, and circus operators using clearly commonly domesticated animals that happen not to be caught by the list would then be open to prosecution. To, so to summarize my views on amendments one to three, I see no advantage in restricting the tried and tested meaning of wild animals on the face of a bill by referring to lists in other legislation, um, such as the Habitats Directive uh, or the Dangerous Wild Animals Act 76. In regard to amendments 14 to 18 and 20, I consider that the risks to law-abiding travelling circus operators would be too great if a list of domestic operators uh, was uh, domestic animals was adopted, ensuring any such list was comprehensive and up-to-date would be critical and difficult with potentially serious consequences if this is not achieved. And these examples do illustrate quite clearly the, the dangers of trying to construct a list of animals that are or are not wild for the purposes of the bill and underlines why the definitions already in the bill provide what we consider to be the correct approach. If I could move on to Amendment 12... I do understand the committee's concerns regarding the need for clarity in this matter. I fully accept that there may be occasional cases of genuine doubt as to whether a type of animal is of a kind commonly domesticated in the British Islands or wild, since where a type of animal sits in these two categories is not fixed, but can change over time, as I've indicated in particularly obvious examples of packers and llamas. I have therefore lodged Amendment 12, which would provide Scottish ministers with a power to make regulations to include or exclude specific kinds of animals as wild animals for the purpose uh, of the Act. And as I stated at the Stage 1 debate, these regulations would be subject to the affirmative procedure, which is consistent with the procedure used for other animal welfare secondary legislation and would allow full consideration of any future regulation by the committee. Uh, we would be using this power in the cases of genuine doubt. And this approach would have the advantage of retaining the tried and tested definition of wild animal currently used in the Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Act 2006 and its English equivalent, the Zoo Licensing Act 1981, and the most recent Welfare of Wild Animals in Travelling Circuses England Regulations 2012, therefore keeping consistency. However, it would go further by allowing Scottish ministers to exclude or include specific kinds of animals as wild animals in a targeted manner to remove any doubt in particular cases where there is uncertainty. And I think that this amendment does address the committee concerns regarding definitions uh, without bringing in the difficulty of the issues that, I've, uh, that would arise from the alternative approaches proposed. So I would respectfully ask John Scott and Mark Ruskell not to uh, move or press uh, their amendments um, and I uh, move Amendment 12 and ask the committee to agree to that. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Um, I've come to this quite late, of course, but I've had an intensive weekend of study. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the Cabinet Secretary has uh, slightly preempted me because I identified I have llamas three miles from home. Uh, there are vicunas and alpacas ten miles from where I live. So these are species not covered in the lists that I think now might be regarded as commonly domesticated in the British Islands. Um, I, th I think, too, there is a... A bigger issue, uh, perhaps, in the sense of uh, feral 
animals. Uh, for example, the dingo dog, now regarded as a wild dog in Australia, is in fact descended to and genetically linked to the dogs which are still here in the UK. So one would have a, an interesting debate as to whether a dingo imported into the UK uh, was commonly domesticated because genetically it might be very close cousin. So I, I, I just give that as an example. And of course there are also things like the wild horses on Exmoor which could be brought to Scotland, albeit I think they are semi-domesticated in some ways, and there are colonies of wild goats and wild sheep. And of course there are cats that go feral. So there's a whole range of ambiguities. Um, uh, I, well, in, I, <laughs> the Cabinet Secretary says, uh, Wallabies, um, I, my experience is comprehensive but not total, and I haven't yet uh, met any uh, wallabies. But one could even consider uh, rabbits, which are actually domestic animals introduced by the Romans 2,000 years ago, which are now regarded by us as uh, totally wild animals. So the ambiguities associated with the production of lists which of their very nature cannot be comprehensive in their coverage, but more fundamentally create the loopholes by exclusion from the list that could enable uh, circuses uh, to, 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 to exploit the omissions from lists. So I very much uh, support what the Cabinet Secretary has had said and the approach she's taken, while absolutely understanding and sympathising with the underlying motivation of John Scott and Mark Ruskell, but in particular uh, the Amendment 20 that the Cabinet Secretary make forward, it brings forward is that safety net uh, for that which we cannot currently know and which may only dis we may only discover in the future we are required to do. Convener. Thank you. Richard Lyle. So I, I agree with uh, the comments that Stuart Stevenson just made and also the, the Cabinet Secretary. At the end of the day, I can see where uh, Mark Ruskell and John Scott are coming from, but I think a list is really going to um, set the, the whole thing back. Remember, we've got 32 councils that have got to work this and 32 different council officers who also can have different varying views. I'm reminded that there are some domesticated camels and there are also wild camels. So, you know, we could go in through every species and say, oh, that's wild, or well, that's domesticated. And before we know it, the list will be endless, the list will need to be reviewed. And also, we will have owners who will sit with a list and go, oh, I can have a circus with that animal because it ain't on the list. So, as far as I'm concerned, I think a list is wrong, and I certainly will not be supporting any of these amendments. Okay, uh, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Convener. This is indeed something I find quite complicated, if I'm uh, open about it. I, I think um, lists often do have their dangers, and um, while I, I was keen to support the possibility in John Scott's amendments of, of a list of wild animals in view of the need for a strong clarification, um, in view of what the Cabinet Secretary said, I do now have concerns about that. So at stage two, I wouldn't be wanting to support um, John Scott's position. Um, I, I, I have had concerns right the way through about supporting an alternative list for domestic animals, which I think would make things further complicated. So um, although I understand the sentiment of it, and it is very important we, we're as clear as possible, I'm not... I'm not clear myself that this, this that um, Mark Ruskell's amendments would add something uh, to to um, clarification of um, who is and isn't a domestic animal. <laughs> um, so I, I, I won't be supporting at this stage. I think it may well be necessary to revisit lists, um, uh, not on the face of the bill, because of the difficulty of changing them, but possibly after further clarification. I wouldn't rule out consideration at stage three. At this stage, um, uh, I would be keen to support the Cabinet Secretary's Amendment 12, um, which I think does lead to further clarity. OK, thank you. Mark Roscoe, do you want to come back? Um, yes, thank you, convener, for that opportunity. Um, uh, listen carefully to what the Cabinet Secretary said. Um, I would like some clarification over Amendment 12, though, because this enables ministers effectively to make a regulation about the kind of animal that's regarded as wild 
and a kind of animal that's not regarded as wild, does that in effect then draw up a list of those animals that are wild and those animals that are commonly domesticated? Um, because if it, if it does, then there still has to be this consideration about where you draw the line and where it's acceptable to have an animal based on the three ethical considerations at the heart of this bill to perform in a circus or not. Um, if I could just briefly go back to the issue about um, frequent updating uh, of lists or consideration. The, the nature of domestication is that it happens over multiple generations. And the Cabinet Secretary mentioned you know, how we consider the changing use of alpacas and llamas. That's occurred over at least a generation, a human generation, 30 years or so. So the idea that we'd be updating this, any kind of list, whether it's under uh, Amendment 12 or the other amendments in this group yearly, um, I think simply wouldn't happen. Domestication happens over a long period of time. Um, the culture about how we use animals changes over a long period of time. Um, so I don't believe this is an issue that needs to be revisited the whole time. But I would seek just some clarification about the Cabinet Secretary about in what way the regulations would actually be, be brought in potentially by the Scottish Government and where do you draw the line in terms of a list of species then? Cabinet Secretary, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, yes, I, I think there's a slight misunderstanding. I mean, m most of us can agree on pretty much all of the animals that are domesticated and all of the animals that are wild. What we're talking about is those small numbers where there may be some real dubiety or an animal which we haven't heard of or, or met before or isn't normally uh, um, used in, in circumstances at the moment here. So we've got a, you know, a situation that might be slightly uh, ambiguous where there's real doubt as to whether an animal is domesticated uh, or, or wild. So the expectation is that the regulations would only come into play when we were confronted with that real doubt. I mean, these regulations won't be coming into play if somebody is using a lion or a dog because one is clearly domesticated, one is very clearly wild. It's only when you're in that situation. And I, I jokingly made the comment about the wallabies, but you see that, you know, the, 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 there are wallabies in Scotland. They, are, they, 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 they got free um, and they've now colonised in a small part around uh, in the Loch Lomond Trossless National Park. Um, so you, you can understand how uh, an animal, which we've not previously thought of as being an animal that's, that's in, in, uh, uh, in Scotland, or I don't know whether wallabies are being domesticated in Australia by now or not, but, but you know, we get confronted from time to time with an anomaly, and it's those anomalies, I think, that we would be looking at these regulations to be dealing with not the widely understood idea of domesticated and wild. I mean, the vast majority of the animals that both John Scott and Mark Ruskell listed are, are clearly what they are defined to be. But the minute you start specifically listing, you could hear straight away how that then left off from each list other animals, which just around this table, around this room, we were able to bring up examples of. And if we could bring up examples of, you can bet your boots that everybody else is going to be able to as well. So we, we're, we're using common understanding of wild animal, domesticated animal, and these regulations, Mark Ruskell is quite right, they're not going to be used you know, every six months or every year, but only when um, a very particular anomaly arises and there is real doubt as to whether a particular animal falls into a particular category. And that's the, and it will be, you know, it will be a, um, a consideration of that particular animal, and we will be hearing evidence and getting information about that particular animal. Okay, Stuart Stevenson, do you want to come back very uh, briefly? I just wanted to, uh, Cabinet Secretary, it, it strikes me that when I look at uh, the Amendment 12, paragraph 2, subsection A, it makes very clear that in no sense is the generality of commonly domesticated and other parts of section two is not undermined or replaced by any list that might be created uh, by secondary legislation. And that that is a very, probably the most important part of the amendment that you seem to be bringing forward, that it protects the generality, even though there may at some point in future be, I suspect, a quite short list introduced by this. It, complements but does not replace the generality. Okay, thank you, Mr. Stevens. Does any other members wish to contribute? Okay. Um, I think it's worth noting that 
both Mark Roscoe and John Scott's amendments are uh, entirely constructive and well-intentioned and what they set out to achieve. But I think as we've heard today, there immediately are difficulties thrown up with them. And I think perhaps it reflects the wisdom of the committee in handing this back to the Scottish Government uh, in our stage one report when we asked the Government to reflect upon the issue of lists, although we, some of our members have kindly attempted to assist in that. Um, on that basis, I, and having reflected upon it, I couldn't support either of, of, of the amendments uh, brought forward by those gentlemen, although I would stress, I think they were constructively offered. Um, no other members wish to contribute. John Scott to wind up and either press or withdraw his amendment. Um, thank you very much, convener, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her explanation of the apparent weaknesses of my uh, three amendments, which perhaps convinces me of the dangers of seeking to have lists. And she named species, certainly, in her explanations that I was not even aware of. And certainly my intentions were was to include animals in definitions rather than exclude them. Also, the burden of frequent updates uh, on Parliament would not be one I would wish to foist on future generations of parliamentarians in terms of subordinate legislation. I, I welcome, however, that the Cabinet Secretary has brought forward uh, Amendment 12 and that it will be subject to the affirmative procedure. I believe Mark Ruskell's um, intentions and amendments uh, and mine ha have served their purpose to encourage the gov government to further refine their approach. Um, and as probing amendments, uh, they have served their purpose. And I welcome the explanation from the Cabinet Secretary as to how Amendment 12 will work. I share some of Mark uh, Ruskell's uh, remaining concerns, but uh, I will therefore... Um, with the committee's permission, uh, not move my amendment, as I believe the committee's view is now to support Amendment 12 instead. So you're withdrawing your amendment, or you're seeking to withdraw your amendment? Yes. OK. Uh, are the members uh, comfortable with that? Yes. OK, thank you. So I now call Amendment, four, uh, sorry, call amendment 14 in the name of Mark Roscoe, already debated with Amendment 1. Mark Roscoe, to move or not move? Uh, to not move. That to amendment. not move. Are the members comfortable with that? They are. They are indeed. Yeah, thank you. The question is that Amendment... Uh, sorry, the, uh, I now call Amendment 15 in the name of Mark Roscoe, already debated with Amendment 1. Mark Roscoe, to move or not move? Uh, to not move. To not move. OK. Um, I call Amendment 16 in the name of Mark Ruskell, already debated with Amendment 1. Mark Ruskell, to move or not move? Not move. Not move. Thank you, Mr Ruskell. I call Amendment 2 in the name of John Scott, already debated with Amendment 1. John Scott, to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 17 in the name of Mark Ruskell, already debated with Amendment 1. Mark Ruskell, to move or not move? Uh, not move. Thank you. Um, I call Amendment 18 in the name of Mark Roscoe, already debated with Amendment 1. Mark Roscoe, to move or not move? Not move. Not move. I call Amendment 3 in the name of John Scott, already debated with Amendment 1. John Scott, to move or not to move? Not moved. Thank you. Um, the question, therefore, is that Section 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Now, do we need to call this? Another schedule. Yeah, I call Amendment 20 in the name of Mark Roscoe, already debated with Amendment 1. Mark Roscoe, to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved, thank you. I now call Amendment 19 in the name of David Stewart, group with Amendments 8, 9, 10, 11 and 13. David Stewart, to move Amendment 19 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, while one kind initially took the view that Scottish courts would be well able to interpret the word circus in the case of any proceedings under the new Act, uh, they accept the point made at stage one that it's not particularly practical for enforcement agencies to have to wait for judicial definition when addressing possible breaches of the legislation. Cases in court are the tip of the enforcement iceberg, and local authorities need to be able to act quickly and work with clear, comprehensive legislation at all times. Understanding of the word circus was complicated by discussions in the committee at stage one, set out in detail in stage three of the stage one report. I therefore believe it's essential to include a clear definition on the face of the bill. Uh, Amendment 19 reflects the previous discussion, 
covers the necessary elements and would aid interpretation of the legislation at all stages, from consideration of enforcement through to the court process. Uh, therefore, I move Amendment 19, Convener. Uh, thank you. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, to speak to Amendment 8 and other amendments in the group. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, I mean, obviously, the definition of travelling circus uh, that was contained in the bill uh, has been a subject of some uh, conversation and uh, deliberation, um, and the committee uh, considered that the term place to place could inadvertently capture wild animal use in a static circus that uh, relocates. Part of the concern raised by the committee uh, regarding what constitutes a travelling circus related to parallel concerns around the lack of a definition of the word circus in the bill. Um, so I will speak uh, uh, to amendments 8 to 11, dealing with the wider definition of travelling circus first, um, and then come back to amendments 13 and 19, dealing with the more complex topic of defining the word circus. Um, with regard to amendments 8, 9, 10 and 11 in my name, uh, the mention of the text in section 3 of the bill relating to travelling circus is to clearly target the ban on travelling circuses so that static circuses and any other enterprises not considered to be travelling circuses should not be caught by the ban. I thank the committee for their close scrutiny of section 3 of the bill and for raising their concerns. Um, the amendments address committee concerns that travel from place to place could inadvertently capture enterprises which are not in fact travelling circuses by replacing this phrase with from one place to another, provide more clarity on the type of travel necessary to make a circus a travelling circus under the bill by describing travel as being, quotes, regularly or irregularly from one place to another for the purpose of providing entertainment and specifically mention a relocated static circus as an example of what would not be included as a travelling circus. I believe these changes do go a significant way to addressing the committee concerns regarding the definition of a travelling circus. Um, if I could move on to the topic of defining the word circus uh, to outline why I support or will be supporting uh, or would recommend support of Amendment 13 uh, lodged in the name of Graham Day um, and why I could not recommend support uh, of Amendment 19 uh, in the name of David Stewart. The, st the Committee's Stage 1 report recommended that the Scottish Government include a clear definition of circus on the face of the bill, and the view of the Committee was that such a definition was crucial for the correct targeting of the ban, and that without it, the bill would be difficult to enforce. And this was a view that did come through strongly, I think, in this Stage 1 debate. Now, I understand these concerns regarding the targeting of the bill, and the intention is to ensure that the ban on the use of wild animals is effectively focused on travelling circuses. However, a specific definition on the face of the bill, such as that provided by Amendment 19, would be frozen. I remain extremely concerned that such an approach would risk the unintended consequence of capturing or excluding certain enterprises precisely because of its rigidity. A narrow definition... Uh, would provide travelling circuses uh, with a clear blueprint of how to avoid uh, the, ban the ban by making adjustments to their shows rather than by halting the use of wild animals. And this could inadvertently provide travelling circuses with a continuing opportunity to bring wild animal acts to Scotland and use them in their performances or displays. Conversely, a wide definition has the potential to capture the use of wild animals in many sectors that it is not intended to ban. So I do thank Stuart, David Stewart for lodging his amendment, but I am concerned that the very wide definition he proposes would ban the use of wild animals in a much broader range of activity than just travelling circuses. It has the potential to capture wild animal use in many sectors where it is not intended for the ban to have any effect. For example, film use, bird of prey exhibitions and festive reindeer could be said to involve animals performing tricks or manoeuvres or being displayed or exhibited. However, I recognise that the committee and some stakeholders remain very concerned by the issue and I also acknowledge that there may be occasions when enforcement authorities will need to carefully consider whether or not a particular enterprise is a travelling circus 
and hence included under the ban. I expect the guidance that we will be issuing to local authorities will provide assistance in making such decisions. However, um, uh, the Amendment 13, uh, which um, uh, will be dealt with a little later, does provide powers to address these concerns conclusively in cases of uh, doubt um, and would provide a power to make regulations to include or exclude a particular type of undertaking, act, entertainment or other similar thing within the meaning of travelling circus for the purposes uh, of this Act. I appreciate, Convener, you're probably coming back to Amendment 13. Uh, um, uh, you want me to do it now? Right, OK. Um, so the, these regulations um, would be subject to the affirmative procedure, consistent with the procedure used for other animal welfare secondary legislation, and uh, allow the committee to fully consider individual cases. Again, it would be used only in the case of genuine doubt. The proposed Amendment 13 does this while avoiding the significant challenges that would accompany a requirement for a complete list of all the types of undertakings, acts, entertainments or other similar things that are to be included or excluded from the definition of travelling circus. Any such list is unlikely to ever be comprehensive and it is highly likely that some types of enterprise would be omitted and it also avoids the potentially overly wide net that would be provided by the definition in Amendment 19. So the adoption of Amendment 13 would mean that in the majority of cases, a bill would rely on the commonly understood meaning of circus and Section 3 to define, define a travelling circus, which we believe is a strategy already working well for other legislation. However, in cases of genuine doubt about a particular kind of enterprise, we would have the power uh, to come back and revisit it. So. I, I feel that Amendment 13 is the more effective way of addressing the committee concerns uh, and I'm grateful to the work of the committee uh, in considering this issue um, uh, and to Mr Day for bringing this amendment forward. Now, I need to add one small uh, but nevertheless important um, note about Amendment 19, um, which is that we have doubts about the legislative competence uh, of this amendment, um, and I feel I do have to draw that to the uh, notice of the committee. Um, we feel that it is out with legislative competence and, and may put the whole bill uh, in jeopardy. Um, um, I, I can expand on that if you want me to at this point. She has been nodded. That would right. be useful. Okay. Um, the, the definition in in David Stewart's amendment widens the type of activity which is caught by the offence to include any peripatetic or travelling animal display activity. And this could include, as I indicated before, festive reindeer displays, birds of prey displays. The Scottish Government position is that there is insufficient evidence of moral opprobrium or welfare concerns associated to all travelling animal display activities, such as to justify a complete ban on use of wild animals in such ventures. And without evidence of a legitimate justification for such a ban, um, there could be a risk of acting incompatibly with rights under ECHR or EU law. Okay, thank you for that, Cabinet Secretary. I now call myself to speak to Amendment 13. Um, in its stage one report, the committee raised, con raised concerns around the definition of a circus or lack of within the bill and how that would impact on what might and might not be viewed as a travelling version as such. Um, in responding to that stage one report, the Cabinet Secretary indicated a willingness to consider any am amendment aimed at bringing clarity that was brought forward, providing an effect that did not have unintended or unwanted consequences. I think this amendment, complemented by clarifying guidance, would get us as far as we reasonably can to address the Committee's concerns, whilst not creating wriggle room, either for activities that should be captured by the scope of the Bill uh, to escape it, or those that might be, or where we would have acts that might be described as acts of, or entertainments that were never intended to be captured, to be caught. So I hope the amendment addresses the unanimous concerns expressed by the committee. Essentially, the amendment would give ministers a power to bring forward regulation either to define an activity that was perhaps contending it was not a travelling circus when it was indeed intended to be the subject 
of the bill, but similarly to define an activity that was never intended to be captured but might become the subject of efforts to contend it was. I'm thinking of things such as reindeer visiting shopping centres or wild bird shows. The amendment calls for such regulations to be brought under the affirmative procedure which would afford this committee or any relevant successor committee to properly interrogate them. Um, and clearly we would wish, of course, that there was never a need for these powers to be exercised. But I think between uh, accepting this amendment and the guidance, the accompanying guidance to the bill to be as clear as possible, we get where we need to go. So um, I open it up now to members. Uh, Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, looking at what uh, David Stewart intends, uh, I've no particular difficulty with, and it does address uh, recommendation eight in the committee's report. But the wording um, blows the whole thing wide open. Uh, looking at uh, subparagraph A, in relation to animals which are kept or introduced wholly or mainly for the purpose of. Now, how would I get round that? Very simply, um, I, would, I would simply get my animals, lease them uh, from a zoo, for no more than 182 days per year. Therefore, they're in the zoo for 183 days per year. And therefore, they are mainly zoo, and only subsidiarily are the circus. Um, second, kept or introduced. Now, I'm not quite sure what introduced in the context means, but kept, if they are actually normally kept by another enterprise, which is not the circus, such as a commercial zoo, and there are commercial zoos, then again, the, uh, the whole thing would escape. Now, I'm sure further examination might find other ways in which the particular words that are used, you know, and that's an issue the member might consider further. Um, I, I think in, the, in relation to the particular words we have before us, I think it would be extremely unwise because of the quite straightforward ways that we can see you could get round them for us to uh, accept and approve this particular amendment. Thank you. Uh, Donald Cameron. Thank you, Convener. Two, two points. Firstly, on legislative competence. Um, I'd be interested to know what provisions of EU law or the Convention on Human Rights uh, the uh, Cabinet Secretary has in mind um, in, in terms of taking it out with legislative competence. That's my first question. My second one is in relation to David Stewart's um, proposed amendment. Um, I um, take on board what the Cabinet Secretary said about various issues around the wording of, of A and B, um, and therefore find it difficult to, to support. But the principle of defining the word circus, I think, is um, worthy of further consideration. This is a bill that goes to great trouble in Section 3, of defining not just travelling circus, but the phrase circus operator. The circus operator, we are told, means the owner of the circus. Um, and uh, we are told later that any person with overall responsibility for the operation of the circus. Does the Cabinet Secretary um, think it sustainable to um, uh, pass legislation regarding wild animals in travelling circuses without defining the very word circus. We'll come back to that in a second. I want to let Kate Forbes come in. Just a, a very brief comment. I understand the intention of David Stewart's uh, amendment. Um, my main concern is that it would mean that the legislation goes beyond its intention. And the main concerns that we raised during the course of evidence around, for example, um, travelling reindeer I fear would be captured, which is one of the, the main concerns we're raised. However, I do see the temptation, uh, this, the temptation to, to define circus. Thanks. Any other members? With Mark Roscoe. Yeah, come. thanks, convener. Um, I mean, I see Amendment 13 as being, you know, constructive amendments being brought forward, but I think it perhaps falls into the same trap as Amendment 12 that we'd already debated around um, the definition of a wild animal or domestic animal. The Cabinet Secretary says that there, is, there will be, or there may well be, situations where there is genuine doubt in terms of both the definition of a wild animal but also the definition of a travelling circus. And this amendment seems to be drafted in a very similar way to Amendment 12. It's relying on the generality of a definition that's already in a bill, a generality which this committee has already had concerns about in the sense that it's not tight enough. 
Um, so I, I, I would have the same lingering concerns uh, that we just had in, in the previous debate. In a way, this pushes the issue into the future. It says, if there's a legal challenge, if there's a concern about definition, we'll come back and we'll regulate it at that point. So at some point, I would expect these definitions of what is a wild animal and what is a traveling circus to come back, possibly through the courts, and then possibly then through further regulation in this committee. And I just, I just don't know if that, that is the most appropriate way to deal with it. If there is a tighter, more accurate, relevant um, uh, definition of both of these terms now that could be put into the bill, why not put it into the bill at this point, but enable uh, that to change over time if evidence is brought forward? Okay. Uh, do any other members have any points before I bring you back in, Cabinet Secretary, so you could answer any questions that you have to... No, Cabinet Secretary. Right. I, I mean, I, I don't want to be drawn into the broader discussion about definitions and, in legislation, but this is not something that is very specific to this piece of legislation. You will hear this kind of argument played out in almost... Um, any legislation when it comes to definitions and the likelihood of challenges under that. I mean, we accept that there may be uh, in the future, from time to time, some uh, determination to try and challenge this, but that's no different to any other piece of legislation. I mean, I can't think of any legislation where that might not be a hypothetical future possibility. So the, the fact of that being a possibility in the future, I don't think is a defining you know, reason why we uh, uh, we should be going into the kind of contortions that would be necessary. And I think committee members can already see what kind of contortions you get into when you start trying to make these definitions in practice work in terms of legislation. So, you know, I, I am content that where we are at the moment doesn't freeze a definition of circus, which is a thing, the common understanding of which may change over time as as happens uh, to, to many things any more than it freezes a definition of wild animals or domesticated animals. So, you know, the, there is a need to future-proof legislation in that sense, and that's what we're doing. I'm not saying that what we do here will absolutely guarantee there will never be a challenge. One can never, ever uh, say that. Um, but what we're, what we're trying to ensure that is we capture the right things in the right way. And I need to just go back to the very start. Need, members need to remember that this legislation has not been predicated on welfare grounds, it's been predicated on ethical grounds. So we need to make our arguments on ethical grounds and our discussions on the, and the future way this legislation is looked at will be looked at on ethical grounds rather than welfare grounds. If it was welfare legislation, it would look uh, and, and sound uh, rather different. Um, I, the, the specific point that uh, Donald Cameron raised in respect of uh, 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 legislative competence, um, I indicated that we had doubts about legislative competence, and I'm, I'm, you know, I don't know whether or not David Stewart has, has had any of his own conversations with respect to that, um, but in terms of EU law, it's uh, the freedom to provide services. You know, remember that we are interfering with, with businesses here, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, therefore we have to have regard to that. And in terms of VCHR, it's right to property, Article 1, Protocol 1. So, uh, um, you know, we have concerns, uh, and uh, uh, those concerns can be overcome, obviously, by making the arguments, but I go back to this being ethical grounds, not welfare grounds, for us to remind ourselves what the basis of this legislation in the first place is. Um, um, and also, um, I'm just being reminded that uh, clear guidance to local authorities is to be provided uh, on the back of this bill. So um, that guidance will presumably come back to the committee for the committee to have a look at and consider whether they think it's sufficient uh, or not um, before it goes out to local authorities. Okay. okay. Any other members wish to contribute? Okay, so David Stewart, to wind up and press or withdraw his amendment. Um, thank you, Convener. The objective, obviously, of Amendment 19 was to improve the bill. There was some criticism at stage one that there was some vagueness around definition. I was particularly concerned, and I think so were members, to ensure that we didn't just wait for a definition to come through a court process in various test cases, that advice and guidance was given to the 32 local authorities uh, immediately. However, I, I do understand the points other members have made and the Cabinet Secretary has made, and because of that, I will then withdraw Amendment 19. Mr Stewart seeks to withdraw Amendment uh, 19. 
No member wishes to press it. Okay. So we move on then. Uh, call Amendment 8 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with Amendment 19. Cabinet Secretary to formally move. Moved. The question is that Amendment 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. I call Amendment 9 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with Amendment 19. Cabinet Secretary to move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? I call Amendment 10 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with Amendment 19. Cabinet Secretary to move forward. Moved. Thank you. The question is, Amendment 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 11 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with Amendment 19. Uh, the question is, that Amendment 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Section 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 12 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 1. Cabinet Secretary, move formally, please. Moved. Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 12 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're not agreed. There will be a division. Okay. okay. So all those in favour of Amendment 12... Hands down. All those against? All those abstaining? Uh, the amendment is supported by 10 votes, no votes against, and one abstention. It's agreed to. I call Amendment 13 in the name of Graham Day, already deb debated with Amendment 19, and I move that amendment in my name. The question is that Amendment 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No, we're not agreed. Uh, we'll then have a division. All those in favour of Amendment 13? Okay. Yeah. Yep. Hands down. All those against? Anyone wishing to abstain? That amendment is agreed. Uh, the question, by 10 votes with one abstention, no votes against. The, um, the question now is that sections 4 and 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that schedules 1 and 2 be agreed to. Yes. Uh, are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that sections 6 to 8 to be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that the long title be agreed to, and we are we all agreed? That ends stage two consideration of the bill. Um, at its next meeting on 28th November, the committee expects to take evidence ahead of the Scottish Government's draft budget for 2018-19. Uh, I now close this meeting. <laughs>